Today I want to take you into the scriptures and do some teaching on the subject of the resurrection. And in particular, one of the things that I'm going to focus in on today is 12 historic facts about the resurrection. Because there are facts about the resurrection that even atheists and agnostics and critics of the gospel all agree upon. And we're going to be covering those today. Uh, I'm reading out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, and as always, I am not uh, usually one to find one small text and read it and launch into personal commentary. I like you to see the entirety of, of text within context. And so with that in mind, I'm going to read the first 21 verses out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning to read at verse 1. The Bible says, Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. And by the way, I want to pause here. Uh, and if you have a highlighter, if you're ever asked the question, what is the gospel? Uh, so many times people frivolously or lightly say, uh, well, that's the gospel truth without really understanding what the gospel is. And every follower of Christ should understand not only what the gospel is, but you should be able to locate it in the Bible. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is oftentimes the most concise theological definition given for the gospel. And it said this, and this is the gospel. In verse 3, Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. So that part of verse 3 and verse 4 in 1 Corinthians 15, highlight that in your Bible if you do not already have it highlighted, and make a note that that is the purity of the gospel. Verse 5, he was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Pause again. One of the things that I want you to uh, make note of as we teach and study the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that is one of the most incredible evidences to this historic truth, is how many eyewitnesses there were after his death and his burial. After Jesus was raised from the dead, here we read of 500 who were eyewitnesses immediately after his resurrection. Verse 7, then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. So verse 7 tells us not only were there in excess of 500 eyewitnesses, but later, all 12 of the apostles also were eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 8, last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. Sometimes uh, Paul is recognized and referred to as an apostle, and he was, of course, one of the original apostles, Judas. Uh, committed suicide during the time frame of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Paul also stating here that he was a witness. He said in verse 8, I also saw him, verse 9, for I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I am not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. But whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out His special favor 
on me and not without results. For I have worked harder than any of the other apostles. Yet it was not I, but God who was working through me by His grace. So it makes no difference whether I preach or they preach, for we all preach the same message you have already believed. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. I want you to pause again, because here in verse 14, the Bible tells us that if Jesus Christ had not been raised from the dead, the scripture said, Paul said, all preaching is useless. And then he went one step further and made a radical claim and said, all your faith is useless. And so before I continue reading down through the 21st verse, I want to put a spotlight on the importance of that because the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most single point of doctrinal importance in the entirety, not only of the New Testament, but in the entirety of the proclamation of the Christian faith. The resurrection and the factuality and the authenticity and the historicity of the resurrection stands above everything else in the New Testament as the doctrine of supreme importance, and here we know why. Because Paul said, if Christ, in verse 14, if Christ had not been raised, then all our preaching is useless, and all your faith is useless. Let's go down uh, to verse 15. And we apostles would all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. Paul again reemphasizes that without the resurrection, our faith as followers of Christ is absolutely useless and said we would still be guilty of all sin. Verse 18, in that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And highlight the word fact. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. What a wonderful, wonderful passage of Scripture written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, we know that the Apostle Paul wrote this uh, around A.D. 53, so it's early testimony. And as we turn our attention today to the subject of the resurrection, uh, let's bow and pray. Father, as we open up the Holy Scriptures once again, we confess our total dependence upon you and ask in these moments that you would lead us and guide us into all truth. By the Holy Spirit, I pray that you would strengthen the faith of every life and every listener. And above all, my prayer is that not one person listening who is not right with God, perhaps just searching and seeking and has not yet made a decision for Christ, let today be the hour of salvation for them. 
I pray that they would come to know you as Lord and Savior. And in the closing moments of our time together, when we offer that sinner's prayer, I pray that you would give them the faith and the courage to do what they ought to do. Now guide us in these moments and we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and the glory. For we ask it all in the name of the resurrected Son of God, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. The very foundation of Christianity is built upon the fact of the resurrection. Remarkably, even the Bible tells us that if the resurrection is not factual and accurate, then Christianity is useless. Uh, volumes have been written about the trustworthiness of the disciples and the apostles and the followers of Christ, the authenticity of the gospel records, the historic accounts, hundreds of witnesses. There are many things that give us a foundation upon which we can build our faith without having what some might refer to as blind faith. As I often have said through my 40 plus years of preaching, to give your heart to Jesus Christ does not require you to leave your brain on the altar. The Bible is a provable, historic, authentic document that has much fact that backs it up. E.M. Blakelock, professor of the classics in Auckland University, stated this, quote, he said, I am a historian. My approach to classics is historical. And I tell you that the evidence for the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ is better authenticated than most of the facts of ancient history. Now this was a man with great academic credential and a man who was an expert in his field, considered an expert by the experts in his field from Auckland University. And this notable historian testified that the life and the death and the resurrection of Christ is better authenticated than most of the facts of ancient history. Now when we look at the Bible, when Jesus selected his 12 disciples, one of them was a physician, and his name was Luke. He is the author of the third book in the New Testament. The New Testament begins with the Gospel of Matthew, secondly Mark, and thirdly Luke. And Luke as a physician knew the critical importance of accurate information. And if you have your Bible, I'd like for you to turn with me into Luke chapter 1, Luke chapter 1, and I want you to highlight the first four verses in Luke chapter 1 and pay attention to what Luke testifies about. Luke chapter 1, verse 1, Luke writes, Most honorable Theophilus, many people have written accounts about the events that took place among us. They used as their source material the reports circulating among us from the early disciples and other eyewitnesses of what God has done in fulfillment of His promises. Having carefully, pay attention to this, Luke said, having carefully investigated all of these accounts from the beginning, I have decided to write a careful summary for you to reassure you of the truth of all you were taught. Luke, as he begins his introduction to his gospel as a physician, is laying out that the very motivation for him writing is that he wants people to have reliable evidential historic records as to the accounts of Jesus Christ and the gospel. And uh, of course, I don't dispute. I think it goes without saying. And uh, if it doesn't go without saying, and you're hearing it for the first time, I want to honestly tell you 
that throughout the years, the reliability of the gospel accounts have been questioned by many critics of the scripture. But evidence that Jesus Christ was accurately reported in the gospels is not only agreed upon by followers of Christ, but many in the academic world who would be considered atheists and agnostics, agnostics and critics of Bible truths have also come to terms with the fact that the critical dating of the documents and the standards used by liberal critics, the Bible and the gospel accounts, pass all of those tests. Also in your notes, one of the things that I want you to understand is that in addition to all of the historic evidence indicating the eyewitness accounts and how they were accurately recorded is the timeline. Most of these accounts that we have record of took place within two to five years of the actual event. Now, many of them were documented within the very first year. Eyewitnesses documented them within the first year. But again, many eyewitnesses finally sat down and began to give accurate account. Many of those accounts are only two to five years old. Now, that may seem like a long time to you. But in the critical world of literature, having access to eyewitnesses and testimony and documents that are only one, two, three, four, five years after actual events, that is considered high evidence. And the Bible provides so much of that for us. So when you couple with the strong oral traditions of this period of time, along with the early creeds, we have... Uh, and again, not just by Christian scholars, but by anti-Christian scholars, there is an admission that we have substantial proof as to the validity of these accounts. Uh, if we were to just think in terms of attorneys and lawyers and prosecution and evidence and forensics and courts of, of law and how things are dealt with even in modern time, and they had courts of law even in the days of Christ, but cases are won and lost in the legal system based upon the credibility of a single witness. I want you to think about that. Cases, modern cases, older cases, cases that date back through all of trial history, have been won or lost by the credibility of one single witness. One good witness oftentimes has the strong influence upon the outcome of cases. So if you're taking notes, just write the word witnesses down. And with that word witnesses, add to it that we have between, and it's debated, but between a minimum of 518 eyewitnesses and some go as far as 641. Eyewitnesses to what? Eyewitnesses who actually saw the resurrected Christ after his death, after his burial, after his resurrection. A minimum of 518 witnesses, as many as 644, uh, 41 witnesses. Uh, let me answer a few of the common questions that oftentimes come to me on this subject. And the first would be, what makes Jesus different from all other religious leaders who ever lived? And that's a great question. What makes Jesus different from all other religious uh, revolutionaries who ever lived? Well, first of all, he was unique in his person. Jesus, above all other world revolutionaries and religious leaders, was unique, far more unique than any of his counterparts. He wasn't just an unusually spiritual individual. He was more than that. The Bible tells us he was God in human flesh. He was fully man, but fully God. The Bible tells us in, uh, I believe it's Colossians chapter 2. 
Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9, the Bible says, listen to it, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Paul wrote that. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So number one, Jesus was unique in his person. Number two, Jesus was unique in his purpose. Why did he come to earth? Why as the Son of God did he leave the glory of heaven and come to this earth? He gave us that by his own confession in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. In Luke 19 and 10, Jesus said, The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus did not leave the glory of heaven and come to this earth and live his life and teach and set examples and make history and then to be crucified and to give his life on the cross and to be buried and to be resurrected, to return to the Father. He didn't go through all of that to create a religion. I received uh, an email from, I believe she's 10 years old if I remember, but a young girl in one of our recent Lost Lamb Crusades wrote me an email, and that particular Lost Lamb Crusade, the pastor of that church had asked me to speak uh, the entire week that I was there on the subject of eschatology and Bible prophecy and end time events, and uh, I love to do that. I spoke to our associate evangelist yesterday and told him about a course that we've started at North Point Bible College and Graduate School and working with the professor and the president there and starting this evangelism course which will be an evangelism major in the fall. Uh, I said, it is my desire that that course be strong on eschatology, on Bible prophecy, because evangelists living in these last days need to be able to explain to listeners and questioners and critics and doubters the substantial evidence that we have found in Bible prophecy. Jesus was not only unique in his person, he was unique in his purpose. He came to seek and to save the lost. And that little 10-year-old girl in her email said this, The most important thing I learned from evangelist Tiff Shuttlesworth when he was at my church was that Jesus didn't die on the cross to give us a religion. He died on the cross to give us right relationship with God. Uh, at the same time, it made my eyes moist and it put a big smile on my face that a 10-year-old girl was able to grasp that Jesus Christ was not risen from the dead so that he could establish a religion on the earth, but he was crucified, buried, and rose again as evidence that he was the Son of God so that we might have payment for the penalty of our sins. As the innocent Lamb of God upon the cross, He suffered, bled, and died, and took my sin and your sin upon that cross. And the Bible tells us in Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Do you have right relationship with God? Would you like to have right relationship with God in the moments Ahead when I'm done, I'm going to pray with you, and I hope that you'll prepare yourself for that. Why do Christians so strongly believe in Jesus Christ? Well, perhaps the number one reason is the resurrection. Jesus did what no other world leader, not, what no other world revolutionary, what no other religious leader in all of history did. Only Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Now, I want to currently give you 12 historical facts that surround the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want to, before I give you these 12 historic facts, I want you to have a clear understanding that these are 12 facts that are agreed upon, not just by the Christian community, not just by the intellectual, academic, Christian community, 
These are 12 historic facts that are agreed upon almost entirely across academic borders. Agnostics agree to this. Many atheists agree to this. Now, how these are explained, there's much debate. But these are what I would call, if you're taking notes, the 12 most notable historic facts concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Number one, Jesus died due to crucifixion. That is agreed upon, not just by Christians. I want you to remember as we walk down through all 12 of these, that these are historic facts that are pretty much proven to such a degree that people from almost all walks of intellectualism, including atheists, including opponents of Christianity, they do agree upon these historic facts. Number one, Jesus died due to crucifixion. And by the way, he died. He didn't pass out temporarily and then came back from fainting or what is oftentimes called the swoon theory. There is not one single record in all of Roman history of anyone surviving a Roman crucifixion. Very important that you understand that. Not one single record in all of Roman history of anyone surviving a Roman crucifixion. The Romans knew how to torture and kill. And so those with weak arguments saying that Jesus didn't actually die, that he passed out from loss of blood and then miraculously uh, recovered and uh, got up out of his place of burial, unwrapped himself, moved uh, a massive stone that would have taken uh, multiple men to put in place and in his weakened condition. No, this fact is agreed upon across all intellectual academic boundaries. Jesus died by crucifixion. Number two, he was buried. They don't contest that. Even those in the Bible, when you read the Bible, who accused the disciples of stealing the body, made testament to the fact that he was buried and the disciples had come to the place of burial and stole the body of Jesus Christ. Number two, Jesus was buried. Number three, his disciples became depressed, lost all hope, and scattered in fear for their lives. That's not the most noble of facts, but it's fact nonetheless. If you were uh, falsifying a story, you probably wouldn't have made yourself out to be individuals that panicked and, and dispersed because of fear and suffered in depression because your great leader that you thought perhaps was the Messiah who was going to establish the kingdom of God then and put them on thrones at that time. No, his disciples became depressed lost all hope, and scattered in fear for their lives. Number four, his tomb was empty three days after his death. That's factual. He was buried on a Friday, probably late in the day, early in the evening, and was in the grave on Friday, all day Saturday, and then arose early in the morning on Sunday. But fact number four, his tomb was empty three days after his death. Not only did the Christians testify to that, the women were the first ones to come on to the scene. By the way, uh, that would have not been the way to establish a credible argument in the days of the Bible and in the days of Christ. Because in the days of Christ, women had zero credibility. In the days of Christ, women were not even allowed to testify in a court of law. They were considered, their testimony was considered legally as worthless and legally could not testify in a court of law. So if you were concocting a story of the resurrection or you were trying to make up some type of believable story, 
The disciples certainly wouldn't have stated that the women were the first ones to the tomb on Sunday morning to discover the empty tomb. Because that would have been the worst way to try to establish an argument in the first century of credibility. His tomb was empty three days after his death. Number five, a large number of disciples individually and in groups claim to have seen touched, ate, and drank with, and openly talked with the risen Jesus. I'll read that again. A large number of disciples, individually and in groups, claimed to have seen, touched, ate, drank, and openly talked with the risen Jesus. Number six, the disciples were psychologically transformed from fear to faith, from doubters to believers, from cowards to martyrs, timidity to boldness, scattered to unified, depressed to joyous. That is factually and evidentially established. The disciples were psychologically transformed from fear to faith, from doubters to believers, from cowards to martyrs, from timidity to boldness, scattered to unified, and depressed to joyous. Praise God. Number seven, the resurrected Christ was central to the early church's message. And again, anyone who has been a student of the Bible for any length of time, uh, that is so primary, but it is of utmost importance and integral to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ. Number seven, the resurrected Christ was central to the early church's message. And of course, as we read in our passage from Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, if Jesus had not been resurrected from the dead, then our faith is useless. Number eight, this was especially true in Jerusalem, where many of the eyewitnesses lived. This circulation of uh, historicity and evidence and claims uh, was centered there, particularly in Jerusalem, so number eight, this was especially true in Jerusalem where many of the eyewitnesses live. Now why is that important? It's important because if you enter into a small community and nobody knows you and you make some almost unbelievable claim, then people can pretty much either receive it or reject it based upon your salesmanship of whatever it is you're trying to teach or tell. But the fact that so many of these witnesses all lived in this community, if they had been lying, there would have been too many people in the community that could have disproven their lies because they knew them, they lived with them, they worked with them, they socialized with them, they worshiped with them. And, and there were multitudes, as we've already mentioned, in excess of 500, in excess of 600, depending upon various records and accounts. Number nine, as a result of the message of the resurrected Christ, the Christian church was born and grew, and grew significantly. Number nine, as a result of the message of the resurrected Christ, the Christian church was born and grew. Number 10, the church switched from Saturday to Sunday as its day of worship because of its belief that Christ rose on the first day of the week, Sunday morning. The church switched from the Jewish tradition of worshiping on Saturday to Sunday. An important fact for many of you to know, even outside of the resurrection truth and the Easter message. Number 11, the half-brothers of Jesus such as James, 
did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah until he appeared to them personally after his resurrection. So the family and the half-brothers of Jesus who had rejected him, they grew up with him. It was their younger brother. Uh, in some cases, their older brother. But nonetheless, they did not receive him as the Messiah. Can you imagine your brother, your sister claiming to be born of a virgin and the son of God or the daughter of God, the, the promised Messiah, fulfilled prophecy? Too hard for them to swallow growing up with him in the same house. But after his resurrection, they all became believers. And then number 12, Saul of Tarshish became the Apostle Paul after he claimed that the resurrected Christ confronted him on the road to Damascus. Saul of Tarshish became the Apostle Paul after he claimed that the resurrected Christ confronted him on the road to Damascus. And the results of this confrontation of the Lord Jesus Christ after his resurrection and the Apostle Paul could never be underestimated. Amazing what the Apostle Paul became to the early church. Uh, many notables in higher criticism agree that biblical explanations are not the only explanations that make historical, logical, and psychological sense, common sense on those terms. One scholar wrote this, listen to this carefully, quote, No one in all of history has changed the world the way Jesus has. Throughout history, the influence Jesus had on the lives of people has never been surpassed. No other great leader has inspired so many positive changes in the lives of his followers. People who encounter the risen Christ are totally transformed. Their outlook on life is altered forever. Staying true to their faith, they do not hesitate to face hardship, persecution, and even death. Many consecrate their lives to serving others, minimizing their own needs and desires. That is so good. Many of you will remember a man by the name of Dr. Charles Colson. He was uh, involved back in the administration of our former president by the name of Richard Nixon. And uh, many of you will remember that under the presidency of Richard Nixon, that there was the untimely scandal called Watergate, which happened to be uh, the name of the hotel where a lot of this took place. But as a little background on Charles Colson, he served as special counsel to President Nixon from 1969 through 1970. And he became quite famous because of the Watergate scandal and became the first member of Richard Nixon's administration that was placed in prison. Uh, he was charged and convicted with obstruction of justice for Watergate-related charges. He was known... Uh, by his colleagues and in all of his spheres of influence as one of the most brilliant minds in Washington, D.C., one of the most brilliant minds in law and politics. Uh, he was a graduate of a prestigious university, Brown University in uh, Rhode Island. He had a Doctor of Law degree that he received at George Washington University and had, if you can imagine, 15 honorary doctorates, and multiple awards. He intensely investigated and researched the claims of the Bible after his conversion to Christianity, and it led to his own conversion in 1973. I set that all up because I want to share with you one of the most brilliant uh, pieces of quotation that I believe came from Charles Colson. He later wrote, quote, 
He said, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. Now let me pause right there. It's one of the reasons why I've always loved this uh, line of logic that Charles Colson presents here, and I'm going to read to you. But Charles Colson, as a doctorate of law, as a lawyer, as a politician, as a man of incredible gifts and intelligence, can you imagine 15 honorary doctorates bestowed upon you? Uh, I, I don't know of anyone. I, maybe there are, but maybe there are, are several, but I highly doubt that there are people in the world that have been so recognized for their high level of intelligence that prestigious universities and places of education around the world confer an honorary doctorate upon you, not to mention he already had an earned doctorate and uh, attended prestigious schools. But let me get back to it. Charles said, I know the resurrection is a fact and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years and never once denied it. Every one of those 12 were beaten, tortured, stoned, put in prison, and were crucified and martyred for their faith. They all could not have endured that if it were not true. He goes on to say this, Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, but they couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep a lie for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. And uh, many years ago when I uh, read his book, uh, that just jumped out as one of the most brilliant things in that book because there's so much truth. Uh, Watergate provided for us in recent history an example of 12 of the most powerful politically connected men, not only in the United States of America, but in circles internationally. And these 12 men, without being tortured, without being threatened, without being beaten, none of which were martyred, and so on. These 12 men couldn't keep that lie from being circulated. I think it came out in less than three weeks, and they crumbled like a house of cards. Historian Philip Schaff described the overwhelming influence which Jesus had on subsequent history and the culture of the world. This is another one of the great quotes concerning the resurrection Quote, he said, this Jesus of Nazareth without money and arms conquered more millions than Alexander, Caesar, Muhammad, and Napoleon. Without science, he shed more light on things human and divine than all philosophers and scholars combined. Without the eloquence of schools, he spoke such words of life as were never spoken before or since and produced effects which lie beyond the reach of orator or poet. Without writing a single line, he set more pens in motion and furnished themes for more sermons, orations, discussions, learned volumes, works of art, and songs of praise than the whole army of great men of ancient and modern times." Many atheists, and, and let me just pause right here to say something, and I hope this doesn't come out as critical. But many atheists, those that attack Christianity, and especially you see this uh, absolutely true in social media and modern social media, but most of the atheists that are attacking the Bible and the documents and the authenticity and the resurrection, most of them are in their teens and 20s and have no terminal degrees. Most, not all, there are exceptions to that. But by and large, when I'm confronted or attacked or in social media uh, attacked by individuals who are critics of Christianity and Christ and the resurrection and Bible prophecy and so on, 
the bulk of them are teenagers to mid to late 20s, the bulk of them. Now, why would I bring that up? I bring that up because at that age, you're not an expert in anything. You have not lived long enough to have read, to have studied, to have lived, to have uh, brought to trial the things that you say you believe. And I say that within biblical context. What do you mean, Tiff, within biblical context? In the Bible, Jewish men were not allowed to speak in public until they were 30 years old for that very reason. Though Paul later told Timothy, let no man despise your youth. In the Jewish culture, you weren't allowed to speak out in public until you were 30 years of age. That's why Jesus was not anointed for ministry until he was 30. Even God's Son submitted to that culture and that custom. And it was at the age of 30 that Jesus opened the scroll and read in synagogue, I am anointed, and began to read that prophecy. And he began his ministry at age 30. And only ministered till he was 33, three years and change the world during that time. You know, one of the great evidences of Jesus Christ is even, uh, we don't have many newspapers anymore, some of you still may have them, but whether it's a newspaper or a periodical or a magazine, almost all uh, historically have placed a date. Have you ever stopped to think that the very calendar that the bulk of my listeners use and I use centers around one person in all of human history, Jesus Christ. When we say 2021 A.D., taken from the Latin Anno Domini, in the year of the Lord our God, calendar time, as much of the world understands it as we in North America understand it, goes back to one single person. It goes back to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And though there is a change in some academic spheres in just recent years, uh, throughout most of, of modern history and even antiquity, uh, we refer to dates either as B.C., before Christ, or A.D., Anno Domini, from the Latin, in the year of the Lord our God, all pivoting around the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even today's date testifies to the Lord Jesus Christ being supreme over all other people ever born. For those who are intelligent and for those who are thinkers and for those who are logical, that should carry some weight. That should carry some evidence to you of all of the multiple billions of people who have been born throughout all of human history. For calendar time to pivot around one single person and that person is the Lord Jesus Christ should be an exclamation point in your searching and in your seeking. Uh, some of you will recognize the name Lew Wallace. Uh, he was a very famous general. He was also a literary genius and was also a very prolific and well-known atheist. For two years, Lew Wallace studied in the leading libraries of Europe and America seeking information along with colleagues, attempting to put together academic evidence that would destroy Christianity once and for all. And they focused primarily in their search of evidence around the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because if one could disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ, as Paul said, all faith is useless. But while writing the second chapter of his book outlining his arguments. He put his pen down, got down on his knees in his office and cried out to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Because in his own academic research, along with his colleagues, he was confronted by solid, indisputable evidence that he could no longer academically deny that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And uh, many of you that don't recognize the name, you'll recognize the book that he wrote. Perhaps the most famous of all of the books that Lou Wallace wrote was the book Ben-Hur. Uh, 
uh, considered one of the greatest English novels and then later became a famous movie. Uh, we could also speak similarly of the late C.S. Lewis. The name C.S. Lewis would be recognizable to a lot of my audience, but for background, he was professor at Oxford University in England. He was an agnostic, partially atheist, who denied the deity of Jesus Christ for most of his life. But he also, in older age, because of intellectual honesty, submitted to researching the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the authenticity of the Bible. And at the end of his research, submitted to Jesus as God and Savior after stu studying the overwhelming evidence for the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And went on to write uh, incredible books, including Mere Christianity, The Screw Tape Letters. Again, much of C.S. Lewis has been uh, used in theater and in Hollywood and in the making of movies I close with this, because of Jesus' resurrection, I want to give you faith today. I want to give you something of substance today to help you to understand that as followers of Jesus and because of the resurrection of Jesus, followers of Christ do not serve a dead founder. You can have a vital, personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The great physicist and philosopher Blaise Pascal spoke of the people's need for Jesus when he said, and this is a famous quote, if you've never heard it, write it down. He said, quote, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which only God can fill through his Son, Jesus Christ. What does it mean to have a vibrant, living, practical relationship with God the Father. Multiple millions throughout history and now billions have all found that a relationship with God the Father is so significant that it changes the very course of life and hope and destiny and future. They say that there are approximately, currently, in the world today, about 2.3 billion followers of Christ. I can't say that without thinking of what I call the greatest prophecy of Jesus in Matthew 16, where Jesus said, I'm going to build a church, and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. We are living in the last days, and the gates of hell are doing their best to prevail against the church and against Christians, and against the morality and the, and the structure of all that the Bible entails. But they will fail, because Jesus prophesied and promised that once He began building His church, that the gates of hell would never prevail. And from the day that Jesus spoke that in Matthew 16 until the 21st century, the church has grown prolifically and continues to grow throughout the world, even with persecution. 2.3 billion Christians around the world. I've taught on Bible prophecy for most of my ministry and we teach on it in our social media formats and many of you that follow us found us searching out Bible prophecy teaching. But Bible prophecy is one of the greatest evidences of the scripture along with the resurrection. As a matter of fact, if you were to ask me what the five greatest evidences of Christianity are. Number one, I would say science. Because if time allowed, and I'm not teaching on it today, so I'll not go down that highway, but there are multiple truths that come out of science that are in perfect agreement with the truth of the Bible. The Bible can be proved through science. Now, many scientists disagree, but there are many scientists that are followers of Christ, and science led them to that decision. I would then say, perhaps secondly, I would turn to manuscript evidence. There are in excess of 60,000 manuscript scrolls, bits and pieces, upon which we can gather the truth of the Bible. And the writing of the Scripture rests upon the greatest manuscript evidence of any document in the world by far. Nothing is even close. 
The Bible's provable through science. The Bible's provable through manuscript evidence. The Bible's provable through biblical archaeology. Over 26,000 archaeological digs in the land of the Bible. Not one has ever disproven any truth in the Bible, and thousands upon thousands of those digs have uncovered evidence that prove facts and truths throughout the Scripture. Number one, science. Number two, manuscript evidence. Number three, biblical archaeology. Number four, Bible prophecy. The Bible, unlike any other religious book in the world, is one-third, almost one-third prophetic content. And all of the prophecies in it, many of which have already come to pass with complete and total accuracy, the only prophecies left to be fulfilled are the prophecies of the last days, the coming Great Tribulation, the Battle of Armageddon, the Second Coming of Christ, the Millennial Reign, the Judgments, Eternity. All of the prophecies in the Bible have a 100% accurate track rate. And then number five would be the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the greatest truths in the Bible that has mountains of evidence agreed upon by not only Christian scholars, but agnostics, atheists, those who would consider themselves opponents of Christianity cannot deny many of the facts of the resurrection. They're just that true. And I always tell people, if you're searching and seeking for Christ, you can reject Him based upon free moral choice. But no one will ever be able to reject Jesus based upon a lack of evidence of His resurrection. I want you to think about that. You can either receive Christ or you can reject Christ. And you can reject Christ based upon your freedom and free moral choice. But no one can reject Jesus Christ because of a lack of evidence of His resurrection. You can ignore it for your own personal reasons, but you can never reject it because of a lack of evidence. Have you ever received Christ as Lord and Savior? Have you come to a place in life where you're ready to place your faith in the Scripture and in the cross and in Christ? If you'd like to give your heart to Jesus, one of the great benefits of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. The Bible tells us that when we come to Christ, there's forgiveness of sins, there's hope for tomorrow. There's a security in knowing that your life is in the hands of God the Father. There is a peace that will come to your heart that can come no other way but through turning from sin and turning to Christ. Would you pray that with me today, wherever you might be? Just pray this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible and the evidence of the resurrection, I felt you tugging upon my heart. I want to be ready to meet the Lord. I want to know that my sins are forgiven. I want to be able to live with a hope for tomorrow and a peace for today. In childlike faith, today I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus. And I invite you, Lord Jesus, to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I vow this day I'll serve you all the days of my life. In place of my weakness, fill me with the Holy Spirit and give me your strength to be what you've created me to be. Now according to the Bible which cannot lie, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Today in Jesus' name, I'm saved, I'm healed, I'm delivered, I'm set free, and I'll never be the same. And I pray this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen and amen.